and sisters in Christ as we gather to worship again this afternoon. Please turn in your the Red Trinity hymnal to hymn 261. In 261, what wondrous love is this. <laughs> Good afternoon, brothers and sisters, and welcome to worship as we end the Lord's Day in God's presence. And what a wondrous uh, opportunity to worship God as we've just sung of the wondrous love of God, the objective truth of the gospel that we know to be true, and how God has worked that into our hearts and lives for which He is most deserving of our worship and our praise. Let's give thanks to Him. A special welcome if you're visiting this afternoon. It's a joy to have you. And we pray you'll be blessed and, uh, and fed by the Word as you're here with us this afternoon. Well, let's take a few moments to prepare ourselves for worship with a few moments of silent prayer. Brothers and sisters in Christ, please stand and hear your God call you to worship this afternoon. Again from Psalm 27, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my mother and my father forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. That is the God who calls us into his presence in a relationship that is closer than even the most intimate and close earthly relationships we can enjoy. Let's pray to him, give thanks to him, and respond to his call 
uh, with faith. Let's pray. Lord our God, we thank you for calling us to seek your face. You do not call us, Lord, uh, without the promise that, uh, Lord, we seek you, you will be found, and that you will richly bless us, your people, that you will care for us, you will provide for us. We come into worship, Lord, then with great expectation that your promises are true, that your, uh, the relationship you've established with us in covenant in Christ is real, and, Lord, that there are so many rich and wonderful blessings that are ours because of who you are and what Christ has done. We thank you, Lord, that even uh, that, that, that relationship with you supersedes even the closest natural relations we might have. And indeed, some of us might have brokenness in those natural relationships, Lord, and pain and hurt from it. But, Lord, we know we can come to you for uh, in, to a safe place, a place where you will care for us, where you will nurture us and minister to us and love us. And Lord, you will enable us even in those trials to overcome. We do praise you for that. We thank you for that. We seek your face this afternoon and we pray, Lord, that we would uh, know that we have met with you in all of our worship. Enable us, Lord, as we receive your call, as we hear you speak to us, give us to respond in faith to dialogue with you in faith, Lord, and Lord, that we would, uh, we would love you more and leave here after this service, Lord, refreshed and ready for service in your name in the rest of this week. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our only hope, our only Lord. Amen. Please take your Psalter, your blue Psalter, and turn uh, as we sing through the Psalter. We'll sing Psalter 53b, 53b, the fool has spoken in his heart. The fool has spoken in his heart, there surely is no God. Unjust abhorrent works they do, intending to cause harm, not one of them. down from heaven high
sing it through the Psalter, but providentially come to this psalm again this afternoon. And uh, as you've sung this, you'll see a number of these themes come out actually in the preaching from Habakkuk, God's protection of his people, his care, his judgment on his enemies and his people's enemies, and his protection for his people. And uh, those who are secure in themselves but not in God have much to fear. Let's turn in, our, in the hymnal uh, to hymn 632. Hymn 632, when the weary seeking rest. And at this time, we'll take up our mission, tithes, and offerings uh, collection. And this afternoon, uh, uh, as we conclude this month, it'll be for the Valley Care Pregnancy Center. Take your bulletin and turn to the uh, liturgy, and we will um, confess our faith using the Scriptures from Isaiah 61 this afternoon, and a confession of rejoicing in the Lord, a confession of joy in our God. We'll say this uh, together. Let's confess our faith. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels, 
For as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Amen. As we come to our time of intercessory prayer this afternoon, um, we will be praying for uh, the congregation in a few ways um, as we deal with some sickness in the church and a number of people that are uh, worshiping with us from home because of that. Um, and, uh, and really, I want to pray tonight for, the, for, for, for God's kingdom to come as we pray that in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's good for us to pray that in our families, in our church, in the valley, and, um, and uh, in the church beyond. We pray for our presbytery as well. Um, just two items about it from our presbytery. As we pray for Reformation Presbyterian Church in Windsor, Ontario, for the church plant there. Just a note there, some of you know John Nyman, who uh, is a student in our presbytery coming to the end of his term. He's accepted a call to Virginia, actually, so he and his family are moving uh, south of the border. Um, so he'll be leaving our presbytery and, and going and doing a church planting work on the, um, there in Virginia. Um, and just last week we prayed for the Van Manans and the, our missionaries in Malawi, and they, are, they arrived back this week. I don't know if you saw some pictures on Facebook. They had planted a banana tree, and now it's producing bananas. So uh, that is, uh, <laughs> pray the Lord to give them uh, other kind of fruit there as they minister there as well, and as they seek to uh, establish that ministry and that teaching uh, Malawians in, um, as elders and pastors and the, the particularly the theological training and seeking for a faithful, um, uh, a faithful church in Malawi of Malawians to be established there. So let's come before our God, our Father in heaven through Christ and by the Spirit, and let's pray. <clears throat> our Father who art in heaven, we thank you that we can approach to you through Jesus Christ, that we have such access to you. It's something we, can, we pray often for, we give thanks uh, about, and we must never lose sight of the fact that our access to you is purchased at the high cost of the blood of your own Son, that it was done, Lord, because you desired fellowship with us out of your mercy and love. And Lord, we thank you for the Savior who has completed the work to make it all possible. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, who enables us to pray, and who ministers in His church. Lord, enabling us to pray together as the church for the coming of Your kingdom, for the cares and needs of the body here and beyond. We thank You for it. We come to You in prayer with thanksgiving for what we are just able to confess uh, about You and the glorious salvation You have given. And Lord, we do, we do earnestly in faith long for our own righteousness and praise to increase. We pray that you would cause that to be so in our lives and throughout this world, and that you would work, uh, Lord, through your church to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, Lord, across the world. Lord, we pray that your righteousness in our own lives would shine forth more and more every single day. Lord, we uh, this week have felt the, the, the weakness of the flesh, and we, Lord, are, we, there's been various sickness. We thank you for sustaining us through this or helping us, be those who are still <clears throat> in the midst of it, who are particularly weak. We pray for strength and recovery. We thank you for Eva's return from the hospital, and we pray for her and her young life and for continued care for her and also for Ben and for Faith and, and the whole MacIsaac home. We thank you, Lord, for, uh, for your gr sustaining grace and for hearing our prayers on behalf of them this past week. We pray for all, though young and old, uh, Lord, and the different needs that we have uh, and the different illnesses that are there, and we pray for healing and for strength. Almighty and everlasting God, we pray that you would mercifully look upon us in our infirmity and weakness. We pray that you would give us all the uh, support and comfort that we need in these things and under every cross and affliction that you call us to bear. We pray that you would strengthen us with all power according to your glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, that whatever comes, that we would not fear what might come, that whatever does come, we would be able to cast our cares upon you and look to you and know that you will give us the grace in that time to endure. Lord, when we are afflicted in every way, we pray that we would not be crushed. When we are perplexed, we pray that we would not be driven to despair. 
Lord, that we, though we, we uh, are sorrowful, yet, Lord, give us rejoicing. And though, Lord, as having nothing, Lord, that we would recognize we possess everything. Lord, we have you, and we have everything we need in you. You are always going to satisfy our needs. You know what we need. Help us to submit our ways and to trust you to provide. Lord, this afternoon as we pray in our prayer of intercession, it's a, it's a time where we are privileged to pray for the coming of your kingdom and for the doing of your will in, in this world. Lord, we pray that this would be true in our homes and our families, that, Lord, in our covenant homes and households, that the name of Jesus Christ would be lifted up, would be exalted, that, our, that, that uh, parents and children alike would hunger for after righteousness and that you would fill them. We pray, Lord, that you would give fathers grace to lead in their families. We pray, Lord, for strong marriages. We pray for healthy relationships with children. And, Lord, that in the way you've structured the home and household, that your name would be glorified. We do pray, Lord, for any tensions that there may be in our households, any frustrations that there might be uh, with one another, Lord, or any miscommunication that's causing problems and division. We pray for repentance where that's needed. We pray for a covering over of sin, a gracious Uh, a graciousness towards each other, and Lord, for your love to abound. We do pray that you would forgive our sins in marriage or parenting or uh, not wanting to obey those you've put in authority over us. We pray that we would pursue holiness in these things, even as we heard this morning. Lord, we pray that your kingdom would come in terms of the church, Lord, as as, uh, we um, desire for uh, your church to grow and expand, for the name of Christ to be exalted, for, Lord, not for our own benefit, but for Christ's glory. We pray that you would stir us to pray for these things and desire for these things in our own prayer lives and our prayers together as the church. Lord, we pray for the local church here as as the elders meet this week. We pray for a blessing upon their meeting. We pray that you would be with the elders, that you would hear their prayers on behalf of the church. We pray for the focus of attention and preparation for our upcoming congregational meeting and the decisions that need to be made there. And we do pray then for that congregational meeting next week. We do pray, Lord, as we, as it's, it's our, uh, as, as we deal with budget and finances and, and building pro- plans and proposals, that we pray that we would not then just assume uh, that this is all dealing with temporal needs and, uh, and not with spiritual needs. Uh, priorities, and we pray that we would rather see these things as, as all part of the work you called us to as the church, that in all the decisions we make, what to do uh, for the budget, where to prioritize our spending, where to spend the surplus, how to go about, Lord, uh, uh, developing a, 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 and expanding this building for, the, uh, for the, the needs of the church, Lord, that we would do this with a spiritual focus, first of all, desiring, uh, Lord, for your kingdom to come in this community, and that you would use us to that end, and that we would desire in every decision we make just to, to, to do what is right for you. We pray then, Lord, that as we meet as a session, and as, uh, Lord, as we come together as a congregation, and as the building committee finalizes things that they need to finalize, Lord, that there would be um, a great sense of focus on the kingdom, focus on, on seeing your name lifted up and this community coming to Christ and that we would not become so internally focused that we would forget that we are to obey the Great Commission. Lord, we pray this knowing the weakness of the flesh and the tendency sometimes to, to let, uh, let um, these things take all the oxygen out of, out of our focus and, or out of our, out of our work as a church. We pray that we would be able to do what's needed and with a right priority and a right focus on your kingdom. So we pray for that. We pray for, for unity in, uh, in all our decisions that we make. We thank you for bringing us and giving us that unity thus far. We pray as we come to the Lord's Supper next week that that time and all its blessing would also be a wonderful time of unifying us together as a congregation, fixing us all on Christ and remembering our head as we serve as the body. Lord, we pray that then you would not only build up our faith, but also build up our unity together. We pray that your kingdom would come in the valley. We pray for the gospel to be proclaimed in every pulpit, in every church. We know that in many places this is not the case, and we pray for repentance and reformation. We know that in many other places this is the case, and we thank and praise you for it. And we pray for, for uh, each, each uh, pastor who preaches the word, that the, that the word would be faithful, that it would be unpacking the truths of the scriptures, or there would not be man-centered theology or preaching, but but Christ-centered preaching and biblically driven truth. We thank you, Lord, and we, we do long for churches everywhere to be faithful to you. 
We pray for your kingdom to come in the broader church. We think of our presbytery. We thank you, Lord, for our presbytery. We thank you for the church planting work in Windsor, for Randy and Allison Lewin and their labors there, and we pray for your blessing on that ministry. We pray for them as, as, they preach the, as Randy preaches the gospel and as there's lots of outreach, and Lord, we pray that you would bless them with, uh, with, with new believers, with, uh, Lord, established believers who are looking for a church home. We pray that you would strengthen and encourage that church family and provide them with, with men to serve in leadership, with a whole congregation or a, a good core that's committed to seeing Christ proclaimed in that city. We do pray, Lord, for Randy and Allison as, they, as, as priorities shift a bit in the new year, as they work not only on that church plant, but also as they prepare, uh, Lord, and look ahead to potentially going to Pakistan as missionaries. And we pray that you would guide and lead them in that preparation as well and help them in language training and, and uh, Lord, in uh, all, all that they must do as they think about gospel work where they are now and where they potentially will be. We do pray for the Nymans as they plan to move from that area to Virginia. We thank you for John's labors in our presbytery and, uh, and for their family. We pray that you would keep them safe as they go to Virginia. Provide for them and their family and bless the church planting work that John hopes to do there. We thank you for this past week for receiving a new congregation into our presbytery in Ontario. And we pray for the congregation at West River Road Reformed Church. And we pray for uh, Pastor Kurt and we pray for all those involved. And we pray that that church... You would strengthen them and encourage them in their uh, commitment to the gospel and to in the city of Cambridge. And we thank you as well, Lord, for answering our prayers regarding the Vinmanans, for their arrival in Malawi, for their labors that you've given them for the next 10 months, and we pray that you'd strengthen that work. And again, may the gospel, may the kingdom be strengthened in that country. And Lord, may men be trained well for, uh, for preaching and teaching and serving and as, as elders. And we pray that you would bless the the, uh, the work that, that Tom does, as well as the, the various other labors that they're involved in. Will you strengthen them? Lord our God, we do pray that you would bless us now as we turn to your word. We thank you that we can, that we can uh, come to your word again this afternoon and hear you speak to us through the word. As we hear of these, uh, these woes that come as judgment to your enemies, but come as encouragement to your people, we pray that we would remember we are safe in Christ. And we would trust you to bring justice in this world. Lord, we pray that, as, uh, that uh, though we can worship you and praise you and give you thanks, Lord, help us also remember how awesome and mighty and holy you are, and that with the whole earth we would also be silent in awe and wonder before you. Oh Lord, we beseech you, that the words, that all the words that we have heard this day and that we will hear yet in the rest of this service with our, uh, with our ears, that, Lord, through your grace, these things would be grafted into our hearts and that they would bring forth in us the fruit of good living. And all this we pray, everything we've prayed before you, desiring for your kingdom to come, we desire it for your name to be glorified. Oh, Lord, that we would be willing to do everything for you to receive the glory. We pray all of this to the honor and praise of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's sing as we prepare for the reading and preaching of the Word. Let's sing hymn 193. Let all mortal flesh keep silence. 193.
Turn in the Word of God to Habakkuk chapter 2. Turn to Habakkuk chapter 2. We'll read verses 2 to 20 as we consider the last six verses of the chapter. This is God's response to Habakkuk's second prayer before him that we have recorded in the book. <clears throat> and so we'll consider um, the last three, oh, sorry, the last two woes that God brings against Babylon and against the enemies of his church. Let's begin at chapter 2, verse, tw- verse, chapter two, verse 2. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Indeed, because he transgresses by wine, he is a proud man, and he does not stay at home, because he enlarges his, because he enlarges his desire as hell, and he is like death and cannot be satisfied, he gathers to himself all nations and heaps up for himself all peoples. Will not all these take up a proverb against him and a taunting riddle against him and say, woe to him who increases what is not his, how long? And to him who loads himself up with many pledges, Will not your creditors rise up suddenly? Will they not awaken who oppress you? And will you will become their booty. Because you have plundered many nations, all the remnant of the people shall plunder you because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city and of all who dwell in it. Woe to him who covets evil gain for his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of disaster. You give shameful counsel to your house, cutting off many peoples and and sin against your soul. For the stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the timbers will answer it. Woe to him who builds a town with bloodshed, who establishes a city by iniquity. Behold, is it not of the Lord of hosts that the peoples labor to feed the fire, and nations weary themselves in vain? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to your bottle, even to make him drunk, that you may look on his nakedness. You are filled with shame instead of glory. You also drink and be exposed as uncircumcised. The cup of the Lord's right hand will be turned against you, and utter shame will be on your glory. For the violence done to Lebanon will cover you, and the plunder of beasts which made them afraid, because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city and of all who dwell in it. What profit is the image that its maker should carve it, the molded image, a teacher of lies, that the maker of its mold should trust in it to make mute idols? Woe to him who says to wood, awake, to silent stone, arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, yet in it there is no breath at all. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Well, brothers and sisters in the Lord, again this afternoon we return to the response to Habakkuk's cry, God's response to his people, his righteous people's cry for, uh, out, out, of, out of questioning and one, and the righteous, the just, those who have been justified by faith shall also live by faith. Those who are trusting in God, the righteous in God, who are believing in Christ, the promised Messiah, or we who are living on this side of the coming of Christ, believing in Christ, we live by faith. Whatever comes, whatever trials will come, whatever struggles in the church, whatever refinement the Lord brings, we live by faith. And it is the enemies of the church who are ultimately and justly the troubled ones, the ones who are troubled by God. And this is a message not just that, was, that was not just good for that time, not just good for Judah, the church looking out at Babylon coming, but it's a message we've been considering as a message for all ages, for the church of all time, for 
we who are in the church today who are uh, striving to live for God and are troubled by the, tr- the, the, the trials that come against the church and by a world that presses in on all sides. And so this message that God is bringing is a message that we need to take comfort from as well. And God, in His response, speaks of this taunt song, these proverbs that would be raised up against Babylon when God brings His judgment upon them. Though at the time He brought this prophecy to Habakkuk, Babylon was at the peak of its power, and yet God was going to bring them down. And He, and he, he brings these five woes against Babylon, these five uh, laments, as it were. Those would be lamenting the downfall of Babylon. This was, these woes were, as I mentioned last week, were those things that were sung at funerals. This was you know, a, a woe. It was the, the Babylon, basically, God is saying, is as good as dead. He brings five woes against Babylon. We've considered three last week. We considered how God was going to, God was going to bring down the enemies of the church for their greed, for their, their vanity, for, um, for their greed and for their vanity and for their false sense of security. This, they're seeking security in themselves. And this afternoon, we're going to consider the last two. The, the, the shame, God bringing judgment on Babylon for the shameful way they acted and for their wicked idolatry. And we're going to end with a focus, as we did last week, on the awesome realities of who God is. Last week it was on the fact that the knowledge of the glory of God was going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, that the world would acknowledge and will acknowledge who God absolutely is as He comes and He acts on behalf of His church. And so today we will end on that standing before God, believer and unbeliever, but being silent in awe at who God is, the world coming to recognize it is not the false gods we've been trusting in, but it is the one true living God whom we must live, who must, we must acknowledge. And again, this message is meant, was meant, yes, it was, it was spoken by God against Babylon, but it was given to the church as meant to be an encouragement. And you and I ought to then be encouraged because God is in control of the kingdom. Jesus Christ is reigning, and in Jesus Christ, we are trusting in Him. We have victory over all our enemies in Him. He is the one who, who restrains and conquers all His and our enemies. And though the enemy, our enemies may want to bring us into shame and want to shame us, yet Christ is the one who removes our shame, who brings us to glory, even when the world may mock and laugh. And that our hope is not to be in any sort of security this world offers, any sort of false, uh, false security that we can get in the creation but in the Lord alone. You and I must live by faith. This message, again, is a message to encourage the church living in a fallen world. And so we continue what we began last week. Living by faith means always believing God will bring down the church's proud enemies by shaming their shamefulness and silencing their idolatry. Living by faith means always believing God will bring down the church's proud enemies by shaming their shamefulness and silencing their idolatry. And that's, our, that's the way this text breaks down. Again, two woes, verses 15 to 17, shamefulness shamed, and verses 18 to 20, idolatry silenced. Well, we have this woe that's brought against Babylon in verse 15. They, they were guilty of shaming the nations. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to your bottle, even to make him drunk that you may look on his nakedness. Babylon was going to face the just judgment of God, and they earned every single bit of it. They earned the judgment of God. The, the, Babylon was drunk on its own wickedness, and it was abusing its power so that it could make, uh, trying to draw others into its realm of wickedness and to draw them and drive them away from God. Now, in this language of, this, uh, of here in verses 15, we're going to get to uh, Babylon being exposed. It's pretty stark language. Babylon was desiring to shame the nations, to look on their, na- to look on their nakedness. God is exposing their sin. We don't need euphemisms to try to make it sound better. God certainly doesn't use them. This is pretty stark language, and and, and it's in some sense you might think crude language, but it's dealing with the reality of what Babylon was trying to do. Now, it talks about giving drink to one's neighbor, making them drunk, and I don't think 
uh, that this is referring to literal drunkenness. I think this is referring to being drinking in the debauched way that Babylon was living, drinking in their debauchery, their wickedness, and their evil. And what Babylon wanted to do was to bring the nations they were conquering into that same realm of evil and wickedness and to bring them into such shameful behavior so that Babylon could expose them. Babylon could bring them to be ashamed and so they could mock them and control them, which is still today with something you think of, 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 of how um, shamefulness is still today an, an element of control in our own society. You think of, of situations we read about in the news, or perhaps you know those who have been involved where, where the... Um, where, where someone uses, say, uh, crude images of you or pictures, or we see this with, in, in, with the young people where they're, they're sending uh, crude pictures of themselves, and now it's used against them to try to extort something from them or to threaten them. If you don't do this, I'm going to send this to all your family. And they're all going to see, and you're going to shame as a sense of control. That's what Babylon was doing. They were trying to shame the nations, bring them under their, their, their control. The world still today tries, tries to draw the church into its own shameful behavior, into the, into the realm of, its, uh, 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 of, of what it does, wanting the church to do what the world does and, how the, and to sin like the world sins. It wants to draw the church into uh, its self-centered way, the world's self-centered way of thinking. It wants the church to approve and endorse and promote the world's views of sexuality. It wants the church. It promises the church all sorts of things, power and, 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 and approval and, and extra authority. What all it wants to do is to point and laugh and mock at the church for caving in and giving in as churches capitulate, as ministers fall. And we see this in, in churches around where when the rainbow flag is on the church sign out front, when uh, when uh, women are in leadership, when the church is all about me and becomes self-centered and it's all about me and the gospel becomes all about me, not about the glory of God. This is what Babylon was trying to do, drawing out the nations, particularly God's people, to join in its own debauched way of living. And God would not tolerate it. And so Babylon, who sought to shame the nations, would be shamed by God. That's what this woe is. Woe to him who does this because, verse 16, you are filled with shame instead of glory. You sought glory. You sought to have power and control. You sought to be something. But God says, you're not going to have glory. I'm bringing you down in shame. You will be shamed. You also drink and be exposed as uncircumcised. The cup of the Lord's right hand will be turned against you and utter shame will be on your glory. God was going to make Babylon drink from the cup of his own judgment. Babylon had made the nations drink from their sin and their wickedness. God was going to make Babylon drink from his judgment. As He, he speaks about the future, but he speaks as, as so certain that he speaks in the present tense. You are filled with shame instead of glory. The right hand of God is a way of speaking of God's almighty power of speaking of his strong right hand over his right hand speaks of his 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 uh, power over the nations of his um, uh, explicit power as it were as opposed to as opposed to the left hand of God's power where it's more subtle but this is this is God will demonstrate clearly and wonderfully his power and this cup in context speaks to the cup of God's judgment the cup that God would make Babylon drink and facing his judgment. This is how Jeremiah speaks of the cup in Jeremiah 25, where he speaks of how God through Babylon would punish the nations for their sin, but then that same cup would come around to them and God would make them drink it. Jeremiah 25, 26, all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world which are on the face of the earth will drink from this cup. Also, the king of Shishak, which is a, a, uh, which is a term speaking of Babylon, the king of, basically, king of Babylon shall drink after them. And that's what Habakkuk is speaking about. You drink and be exposed as uncircumcised. Again, a stark language. To be circumcised was a mark of identity with God's people. To be circumcised was, was God's way of identifying. He, that, that was to say, you are one of mine. That was the mark for his covenant people, the outward sign and seal. 
It was it incorporated you into God, into God's uh, it, it, among God's people, and 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 reminded you of that promise of a coming seed, of a coming king, one who was going to conquer and rule. But if you were uncircumcised, if you were in Israel and you refused to be, you were cut off from God's people. And the nations around were referred to as the uncircumcised. They were not part of God's people. They were cut off. They were enemies of God, not among God's people. And God is saying, you're going to be exposed for being, you're going to be humiliated. You are not one of mine. You will be brought down by me. And this, again, being preached to God's people is a great message of comfort because it reminded Israel that you are mine because I have made you mine. You have that sign and seal of the, of the covenant of grace upon you because I've been gracious to you. And so for us, we don't, we, we, as we considered last week, we need to take great comfort in our baptism that God has set us apart, that bears great responsibility upon us. We have great responsibility to to, uh, to live as those who are God's people, but it is a great comfort to remember, I've been baptized, I've been set apart. God is my God. But Babylon would be exposed as those who are not of God, and their utter shame will be, on, will be upon them instead of glory. And God reminds them of His violence, of the, of, of, of the Uh, justice that he was bringing for the violence they were doing, shaming the nations. Verse 17, for violence done to Lebanon will cover you. And the plunder of beasts which made them afraid because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city and of all who dwell in it. Lebanon was was often used in uh, in poetic language of speaking of something beautiful, that which was gl- of wonderful and beautiful. And here, we've, we've already considered before how Babylon was destroying the nations, slaughtering the peoples. And God is saying, you are destroying that which is beautiful. Your violence, your destruction knows no bounds, and you will reap what you sow. Destroying what is beautiful, you are destroying not you are destroying uh, 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 the, the beasts of Lebanon, never mind the blood of men that was being shed, the violence in the land and the city and the field, all who dwell in it. There was blood, they had blood on their hands, and God would punish them for it. This is given, in a sense, to emphasize their wickedness. As O. Palmer Robertson writes, if the Babylonian lives by senseless violence, God is stating that he shall die by righteous violence. God would bring his judgment his just judgment upon them. Now, brothers and sisters, you and I today can affirm, and we often do affirm this, uh, God's justice. When there's injustice, when there's, when there's uh, a violence today against the church, when, when others want to plot against the church, we, we can send, we, we have, there's a sense of, of, of injustice, and we want, we see, yes, God, you need to bring justice down. You, you do need to make them drink of your judgment. We do this, we ought to do this with humility, and we ought to remember, though, what makes us to differ. We have to think about our own lives, who we are as the church, and what makes us different, what makes us as those who, are, who have God on their side as opposed to God against us. Are we not sinners? Are we not those who, are, who, are, have, our, carry our, who have carried our own shame, have, have, have built up shame against us because of our sin, our wickedness, our filth, our pollution? drinking wickedness. And though we cry out to the Lord and we are distressed as the church, yet we ought to do so with no pride in our hearts. Because you and I have been rescued from such shamefulness, from such wickedness by Jesus Christ. God has sent that rescuer to rescue us from this. Just as He he rescued Israel out from among the nations, called them and set them apart in the hope of the promised Messiah, so we are called out. We are set apart. God has made the difference. And how did God make make the difference? When you're thinking of the cup of God's judgments that we deserve to drink because of our sin against Almighty God and a holy God, it should bring us to Gethsemane, shouldn't it? Where Jesus Christ, the very Son of God who came, took on our humanity and who came down so that He could live a righteous life and He would drink down the cup of God's judgment against us to the last drop. When in Gethsemane, he, under the weight of what He was about to do, He says, He cries, He prays to His Father, Abba, Father, if it be Your will, let this cup pass from me. What cup? The cup of God's wrath against sin. Yet, 
not my will, but your will be done. And the next day on that cross, he drank every drop of the wrath of God for the sins of his people. What has made the difference that you and I are friends of God and not enemies? Jesus Christ has made all the difference. He took our shame on himself and he covers us with his righteousness. So we are not exposed for our sin and our evil, but we are covered by his righteousness and accepted of God the Father. It's a Savior that we have. He makes all the difference. We need to remember that. We are not like the nations because God has made the difference. What a Savior that we have. Living by faith means always believing God will bring down the church's proud enemies by shaming their shamefulness and silencing their idolatry. We've considered four woes. We have one to go, one to silence us. Idolatry silenced, which is 18 to 20. First, there's silence that comes from these dumb idols. These mute idols. What profit is the image that its maker should carve it? The molded image, a teacher of lies, that the maker of its mold should trust in it to make mute idols. It's a series of of rhetorical questions as verse 18 builds us up to that final woe that will come in verse 19. It's a series of rhetorical questions that are asked. And this is a familiar mocking. The prophets you find frequently in the prophets, they mock the false idolatry of uh, uh, the, the, the false, uh, well, the idolatry, worshiping false gods, both when Judah went down that path or Israel went down that path or when to mock the idolatry of the nations. And Babylon was certainly a place that was a, a center of idolatry, a center of seeking different ways to, do, to uh, determine the divine uh, will of God, to try to hear something from the divine, and along with their, their worship of, of Baal and Marduk and their, and their, their own set of gods. Well, verse 18 asks these rhetorical questions. What profit is the image that its maker should carve it? And the, the answer is none. There is no profit, no benefit, no blessing from this. How can it be that you would make something with your own hands and then bow down and worship to it? You're greater than what you've made. How then does it suddenly become your God and you hope for something good from it? What good What good is the molded image, a teacher of lies, that the maker of its mold should trust it? There's no good in it. Rather, it devastates those who follow it, those who bow down and give worship to it rather than to the one true living God, who deny the God they know exists and pursue something created. It devastates those who believe, and it, it speaks the, uh, of these images as a teacher of lies, not because it can speak, it's a mute and dumb idol, but because of its, those around it, those priests of these false gods who claim some revelation, something they've heard, but the idol can never open its mouth. Believing those fake oracles, Zechariah would speak of, of, these, uh, of, of this as well as he prophesied against such wicked idolatry in Zechariah chapter 10. For the idols speak delusion, the diviners envision lies and tell false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, the people wend their way like sheep. They are in trouble because there is no shepherd. There is no benefit, no good that comes from false worship. And why trust? Why does the maker of its mold trust in the idols that he makes? There's nothing to trust. No, there's no logic. It seems, it seems there's, there's no logic. There's no, why, why, would you, why would you worship a piece of wood or a piece of stone? But the heart is darkened. This shows the, 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 the foolishness of man because the heart is darkened by sin. But God is not mocked. No, he says in verse 19, woe, woe to the idolater. Woe to him who says to wood, awake, and to silent stone, arise. Speaking of Babylon, speaking of its hope and its own false gods, in, again, the gods I've mentioned, but even Habakkuk has talked about how Babylon worshipped its own might, its own power, its own weapons, thinking, though, giving that the credit for its conquering of most of the world. But woe to those who say to wood awake, who talk, basically talk to a tree. It's like going outside and talking to a tree or picking up a piece of stone and, and having a conversation, trying to get something out of it. In other words there, it shall teach. It can either be the person ex- describing this, arise, it shall teach, or it's God using irony. It, 
shall teach. Though it's silent, it will teach. It will teach that the idol is dumb and you are foolish for bowing down to it. And though you may cover it in precious metals, behold, it's overlaid with gold and silver, yet there is no breath at all. It's the old saying, you can put, a lip, you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. You can cover the idol in gold and silver. It can look really good. It can be worth a lot of money, but it's still dead. There is no breath, no spirit of God in it. Nothing to be gained. Everything to be lost. They are as we're going to sing in a little bit in Psalm 135, the, the, uh, the clear language, though, though, they, though the Scriptures call these idols gods, it is done with not a sense of respect, but a sense of foolishness. They have, because they, 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 they speak, the idols of the nations are silver and gold, the works of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak, eyes, but they do not see, ears, they do not hear, nor is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. Now, you and I can hear this, and it may seem obvious to us. This is obviously foolish, obviously ridiculous. And in some ways, that's the point. The point of these questions are to expose it as obviously ridiculous. That's the point of asking rhetorical questions, to state the obvious. But there is, again, no place here for you and me to be proud. How is it that we think differently? How is it that we know these are false and that there is one true and living God who is worthy of worship? Is it because we've come to that wise conclusion or because God has opened our eyes to see and to know that this is foolishness and God is wisdom? Is it not, again, as we've heard a few times in the last couple of weeks, that, that God has shone into our hearts the, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ that we know different because God has made it different. God has opened our eyes. You know, we live in a world, in our Western world, that we read something like this and you could find anyone in the street who'd say, yeah, that's pretty ridiculous. You know, this is foolishness. I'm not, I don't bow down. I don't go home and, and bow down to, to a piece of wood or a piece of stone. So we think, and we can think even in our own pride, wow, of course, this is obvious, I'm better than this. Or we can find the unbeliever who says, I'm better than that. But are they really? Anytime you choose the creature over the creator in any shape or form that looks like, you are no different and no better than the person who takes a piece of tree, carves an idol, and gets down on his hands and knees and worships. When we choose the creature over the creator, whether it's a person, whether it's a thing or a job or, a, or money or whatever it might be, and we look for happiness in that instead of worshiping the, cre- the, the creator, we are worshiping it. We are looking to it for our ultimate happiness and expectation. What is it that you and I are tempted to put our hope and trust in? Do you get anxious? Are you worried and fearful or anxious with payday coming up and you're really just getting a bit anxious about it or or when before an election happens or after an election happens does that make you worried and fearful are you looking for your ultimate hope or or any putting your hope in those things as opposed to the one true living God we're no better when we are looking for our hope and satisfaction in that whether it's a good payday or a good election result or uh, having a happy marriage or making sure our children are successful or whatever the temptation might be there's only one place to find satisfaction and it is in jesus christ faith in jesus christ trusting in god and giving him our worship if you're not trusting in jesus christ this afternoon then nothing you're putting your hope in is going to satisfy and you need him You need Him. And we need to be as aware of it as believers that we can still be tempted to put our hope in the wrong things. Hope only in God. The people of Israel were often warned. God's people were often warned. Jeremiah at one point says to the people in Jeremiah 2.11, has a nation changed its gods which are not gods? In other words, have you seen another nation say, I'm going to give up on that God, I'm going to chase after these other idols? No, they were pretty, st- they were pretty steady in who they worshipped. But Israel, God's people, have changed their glory, referring to God, for what does not profit. God is in a sense saying, this makes no sense. Other nations don't change their false idols for other false idols, yet you're changing the true for what's false. You and I must live by faith. Faith needs an object. 
We live by faith in the true and living God who speaks and is not silent. There's silence from the dumb idols, but it is God who speaks and silences us. Silent before the speaking Lord, verse 20. But the Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. There is in this verse a great contrast that God makes. Babylon had all its hope and its idols that were false, could not speak, could not do anything, could not help them. But God is reminding His people, you are people of the Lord. You are Yahweh's people, Jehovah's people. That is your confidence. That ought to bring you great confidence as those who are trusting in the Lord. Your God is living. Your God is true. Your God is powerful. Your God's Word actually is spoken to you and will come true. God is reminding His people as the people would, as Moses reminded the people in Deuteronomy 32, 31, their rock, thinking of the nations out there, their rock is not our rock. Our rock is real and true and steadfast and we can protect it. And God is absolutely faithful to His people. When He has made a commitment to His people, He remains faithful. Babylon's number one problem in all of everything else was that they were idolaters. They were rebels opposing the God who made them. The just will live by faith, but the proud will die. Their gods were nothing but Jehovah God is the self-existent God who does not need man to make Him or create Him or wake Him up. He is true. This is the God who dwells in the holy temple. Now, the Lord is in His holy temple. Some think that refers to the temple in Jerusalem where God dwelt among His people. I do think, though, this refers not to the temple in Jerusalem, the picture of the heavenly temple, but it refers to the reality. God is in His holy temple. Psalm 11 verse 4 uses very similar language. The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence his soul hates. In Micah chapter 1, there's the language of God also in His holy temple and how God is coming down to bring discipline and judgment. God is sitting high above all things, above the world, seeing all things from that great vantage point. And he sees the world conspiring, Babylon conspiring even against his own people to wipe out the church, the, the, doing the bidding of the evil one, the seed of the serpent striving to destroy the seed of the woman. And God, with his anointed one, scoffs at them, as Psalm 2 tells us. God is in his holy temple. And how should the world respond to that reality? The whole earth should be silent before God, reverencing God in awe of God, giving Him the worship that He is due. That it refers to God's people, to you and me, who know the glory of God in Jesus Christ, who know and who God is. We are to be silent before God and give Him worship. It refers to all others coming to know God and trembling before Him as their judge. Do you think that when you get to heaven, you're going to have a few words for God and you're going to negotiate with Him and you're going to get yourself into heaven? In any other way than He's given in Jesus Christ, you have another thing coming. Because when you, <clears throat> if you stand in judgment before God and you are not covered by the righteousness of Christ, you will have nothing to say. You will receive His judgment in silence. But for God's people and for you and me, brothers and sisters, this message is ought to encourage us and stir us to courage and to perseverance. John Calvin writes that though the Israelites might be far inferior to the Babylonians and other nations and be far unequal to them in strength and military and art and forces and in short in all things of this kind, yet they would always be safe under the guardianship of God for the Lord was able to control whatever power there might be in the world. And brothers and sisters, that's true of us today. We will never as the church, we will never be mighty in the world's eyes. We're never going to attract the world. We're never going to make them respect us. We're never going to have positions of power and authority. I think in previous generations in the West, we've fooled ourselves into thinking that we've become respectable to the world, and that's good. But if we are going to preach the unvarnished truth of God's Word, we will not be respectable to an ungodly world. 
And we need to stand true under God with courage on the truth of the Word. We need to remember that God is in His holy temple, whatever the world might think, and He will silence everyone. You and I are under the care of King Jesus Christ. That is far better, far better than being under the care of the world. Living by faith means always believing God will bring down the church's proud enemies by shaming their shamefulness and silencing their idolatry. I've heard this in these last two woes, a message of God that God has brought to encourage His church to build up our faith and to encourage us as a church living in a fallen world. We're reminded of our reigning Lord. Before the service, we sang a Christmas carol, Let all mortal earth keep silence. And that's that, that, if you read those lyrics, they're drawn from this passage, but directed at the first coming of Jesus Christ. They're directed at this reality, the awesome first coming of Christ, that this is God coming in the flesh. This is almighty God coming down in, as a babe in the manger. And indeed, all the world should stop and be in awe of that fact, though when Christ was born, not many did. The world went on. The world moved on. Nobody really noticed. Hardly anyone noticed. It was the, the ones that the, the, world, the, the world didn't care much about. They're the ones who noticed, the shepherds and the, 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 old, the old folks and, and that would go to the temple, and there were, there were very few that noticed. But when Jesus Christ comes again on the clouds in glory, the whole world will stop and be silent before Him. Everyone will notice. All the false gods and the false hopes will be forgotten. The world will stop and acknowledge the Lord is God. And you and I who persevere living by faith in Jesus Christ will see a grand conclusion to the whole plan of God for His people. We will see a grand conclusion to this whole plan. Our faith then will become sight, and we will know, though we struggle to perhaps understand God's ways and purposes now, we will know that God's plan has been perfect and He is bringing it all to that perfect end for the glory of His name and the good of His people. You and I wait for the Lord's return. We trust Him. But between now and then, you and I must live by faith in our glorious, almighty, awesome God, living by faith in His reign over you and over your enemies. And in those moments of temptation when you and I are tempted to look elsewhere for security and for our hope, look up. Remember, your God sits on the throne in glory. Remember that He is in His holy temple. And pray to God that He would give you a reminder of His glory and that He would silence your unbelief. And that as you study and open His Word and you hear His Word speaking to you from Habakkuk and throughout this, from cover to cover throughout the Scriptures, that He would give you that glimpse of His glory, that He would strengthen your faith to persevere. And that even in those moments, He would show Himself to you and leave you silent before Him in awe and wonder. One, that He is God. And two, that the Lord, He is your God. He will enable you to reach that end well, and He will take down all of your enemies. Put your hope and trust in this almighty and awesome God, and let all the earth keep silence before Him. Amen. Let's pray. Lord our God, show us again and again Your glory. We are weak. We are prone to have our eyes wander and fix upon that which are not God's. To Lord, to be, to be prone to fall to temptation to seek security elsewhere and to leave off the study of Your Word, the seeking of Your face, and the trust in You. God, forgive us for that as Your church and strengthen our gaze upon You and let may we, Lord, remember that You indeed are upon the throne in Your holy temple. May we be in awe and wonder of who You are. And may we bring this message of hope and security to many around us. That those who are, who are under the just wrath of God, who face the woes of God against them by faith in Jesus Christ, be brought to know God as their great security, Savior, and Comforter. God, I thank you for this message. For the thousands of years that you have, since you have given it, Lord, it has encouraged your church. Pray, encourage our hearts we, and give us strength even in this week and as we live for you. 
Thank you, dear God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing <clears throat> Psalter 135. 135b. Psalter 135b, we'll sing verses 4 to 7, and then after the benediction, we'll sing verse 8 as our doxology. His grace. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.